welcome to another short video from Elvin Capital Credit Guide series focusing on banking and finance issues that CFOs and Treasury managers may find helpful. This series is devoted to credit agreements. This video and this whole series is brought to you by Elvin Capital, your corporate finance advisor. So without further ado, let's go to our topic for today, which is revolving facility. One short clarification right at the beginning in order not to make matters messy later. When legal documents, including facilities agreements, term sheets and syndication documents, especially those based on the standards of the Loan Market Association, refer to a revolving facility, what they have in mind is an umbrella term for a facility that can take the form of a revolving facility, strictly speaking, or also referred to as cash revolving facility, letter of credit facility, an overdraft facility or a treasury facility. For the purpose of this video, when we talk about a revolving facility, we are referring to a revolving facility, strictly speaking. What sets revolving facility apart from other type of facilities is firstly actual transfer of funds by the lender. Those of you who watched our video devoted to term facilities have already seen that actual transfer of funds is a feature that revolving facility shares with term facility and what makes them both different from so-called non-cash facilities like overdraft facility and letter of credit facility. Second differentiating feature is the fact that funds repaid under revolving facility are generally available for reborrowing. This is the primary factor that makes revolving facility different from term facility. Revolving facility is standardly used for financing of networking capital. For the purpose of this video, we can define networking capital as the difference between company's current assets, other than cash, and its current liabilities. From the liquidity perspective, accounts receivables and inventories equal to cash that is stuck and cannot be used to finance companies' operations and investments. This cash shortfall resulting from cash being tied up in accounts receivables, inventories, and other non-cash current assets needs to be financed somehow. The most natural way for a business to finance this liquidity gap is to get it financed by its suppliers, by making them accept that they will only be paid after some time after delivery of their goods or services. Making more suppliers agree to increasing payment terms builds up companies' account payables. This leads us back to the networking capital equation, according to which increasing value of account payables leads, all things being equal, to decrease in networking capital and thus improves liquidity position of the company. If, due to its market position or for any other reason, the company cannot or does not want to make its supply payment terms more aggressive, it needs to finance this liquidity shortfall otherwise, and this is usually where revolving facility comes into play. The connection of revolving facility to its primary purpose, being financing of networking capital, often translates directly to its drawdown mechanics. This is where we get to a concept of borrowing base. This maximum value of loans outstanding equals to aggregate book value of inventories and eligible account receivables that are used as collateral for liabilities of the borrower under the revolving facility. For those of you familiar with real estate finance, this sounds quite close to LTV or loan-to-value mechanics. The coefficient will usually be further differentiated in relation to account receivables based on whether and for how long they remain overdue. Account receivables that remain overdue for more than 90 days and intragroup account receivables will usually not be seen as eligible to be included into borrowing base. And finally, we get to the rollover mechanism, which is the real magic behind revolving facility. Revolving facility, unlike term facility, only has one interest period, being one, two, three or six months, and technically needs to be repaid at the end of each interest period. This is what may sound quite unintuitive to many people, for instance, in relation to revolving facility, where the final repayment date only occurs after two years, but the facility agreements technically says that the revolving facility needs to be repaid at the end of each interest period, for instance, after the first month after the drawdown. This, however, starts to make a lot of more sense when one realizes that a revolving loan only needs to be repaid in cash repayment at the final repayment date. At the end of each interest period, it can be partially or in full repaid by requesting another drawdown for the next interest period, thus effectively rolling the revolving loan to another interest period. 
So at the end of each interest period, the borrower has following options. Whether it will repay the outstanding revolving loan in full, whether it will repay it in cash only partially and partially roll it over to the next interest period, whether it will roll it over to the next interest period in full, or even whether it will fully roll it over into the next interest period and on top of that request additional cash to be advanced to it by the lender. The decision of the borrower whether and to what extent to roll the revolving facility loan over will usually depend on the following factors. Current and projected liquidity needs of the borrower, costs of drawing the funds, i.e. the interest rate, costs of not drawing the funds, i.e. the commitment fee, which we will discuss in future videos, and the amount of available facility. As we discussed, this amount may be constrained not only by the overall amount of the revolving facility, but also by other constraints such as borrowing base. As we discussed earlier, revolving facility only has one interest period. This implies that even if revolving facility is on floating interest rate, borrower should not be exposed to interest rate risk. This is also the reason why revolving facility usually are not hedged against interest rate risk. The rationale behind this is as follows. Facilities agreements working with floating interest rates are as a matter of principle based on the model that lenders fund themselves in relation to each single interest period on the market and on the quotation date that usually occurs about two to three business days before the start of the next interest period, the interest rate is fixed for the whole next interest period. The second part of the explanation is that the length of interest period, which the borrower is standardly allowed to select, should reflect the cash conversion cycle of the borrower. And at the end of the interest period, the borrower should be technically in a position to repay the revolving facility in cash in full or to a substantial extent, and thus avoid or at least substantially reduce its interest rate exposure. In other words, if the borrower watches market rates and concludes that the interest rate that would be fixed for the upcoming interest period would be unacceptably high, it can repay the revolving loan at the end of the current interest period and avoid paying the higher interest in the next interest period. This is a kind of sunshine paradise model that would work if cash flow projections would be perfect where and would predict the actual cash flows with absolute accuracy. In reality, treasury managers will choose to go for a reasonable cash buffer and based on their mid and long term liquidity projections, choose to keep a part of the revolving facility constantly rolled over until the final repayment date or at least for multiple following interest periods. In this amount of this constantly rolled over part of the revolving loan, also called a rollover floor, revolving facility starts to behave in many respects like a term facility and will expose the borrower to risk of rising interest rates. This is also why some treasury managers choose to hedge the roll over floor. Watching this, you may ask, so if the borrower is cunning and by constantly rolling over the revolving loan, effectively turns it into a term loan and uses it to invest into a non-current asset like an assembly line or even for acquisition of another company, and hopes that it will periodically or via divestment generate enough cash flow to repay the revolving loan at its maturity. Would that work? Well, that can actually happen, especially in view of the fact that purpose for which revolving loan can be applied is often formulated as general corporate purposes, which uh, basically means that it can be used for whatever the borrower deems proper. This also happened in the past and in order to prevent this, facility agreement sometimes contains so-called clean down provision, which is not to be confused with clean up provision, which is a concept that we will discuss in relation to acquisition finance. In accordance with uh, the clean down provisions, the borrower is required once during a certain period of time to repay the revolving loan in cash either in full or in a substantial part. This period is standardly set to one year, which uh, kind of makes sense when we realize that a revolving facility is used to finance net working capital, which consists of uh, current assets 
And by definition, current assets are assets that are expected to be converted into cash within one year. In the future videos, we will discuss other situations in which a boundary between a revolving facility and a term facility can be effectively crossed, especially in relation to a defaulting lender and how its revolving loans are termed out and sliced into separate loans. In the future videos, we will also take a look at how networking capital can be managed by non-debt solutions like implementation of active inventories management like EPQ implementation, smart warehouses, various EDI-based solutions and what role can the current assets and current liabilities that we haven't discussed today, especially prepaid expenses and on the liability side unearned revenue play in liquidity management. So take care and see you in a bit.